All flesh shall see the salvation of our God. I read it in context to you that here is a prophecy that's fulfilled in John the Baptist, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So John the baptizer, he's quite a character. We like John. You know, John was raised in like a rich home. Did you know that? His parents were very wealthy. They were priests, you know, a priest family. They had a lot. But this guy shows up in the wilderness with nothing, wearing just animal skins, camel's hair. That'd be a little itchy, right? Camel's hair, right? And eating locusts and, and wild honey. He looked like a wild man, and he talked like a wild man. Out there preaching in the wilderness. So John the Baptizer comes from the wilderness in the place of Elijah. Because he's a prophet like Elijah with Elijah's message on his parched lips. It's not Jesus' good news. In fact, for most people, it's, it's terrible news. <laughs> it's hard for me to explain the wild popularity of the ministry of John, right? When you hear him screaming at the crowd, you brood of vipers. That means your mother's a snake, your father's a snake, your brothers, your cousins, you're all snakes. <clears throat> you all live together and you hatch your eggs together. You're a, it was, man, it was a low down term, man, that you could call somebody. And it's interesting here in Luke, he says it to the whole crowd, not just to the Pharisees, who we love to pick on them. Not just the Pharisees, the religious leaders, right? The priests and the, the pastors and some of us who can be real jerks, right? And he didn't just say it to them, he said it to everybody. And he told them, he said, being Abraham's children won't save you just because you're Jewish isn't going to save you. He shouts, only repentance and baptism will. Look, the kingdom of God is here. So repent. Now I know it's not when we hear that word repent, you think of the guy in the movies or somewhere standing with this big sign, right? Saying repent, right? It's kind of weird looking, right? And he's got this repent, the end of the world and everything else. But for us, repentance is a gift that comes from God. It is a turning, as I'll explain a little bit later, but a turning that comes from God. He turns us from our way, from our sin, back to Him. And I love what Daniel Price said in one of the conferences. He says, it simply means coming home. Because if you read Luke chapter 15, how does a lamb repent? How did that, it said that lamb repented. How did that lamb repent? The Bible said that the shepherd went out and got him and carried him home. And so all heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents. And the lady was in the home and she found that coin. Right? How did that coin repent? How did she repent? All these, it was about finding. It's about coming home. And the prodigal son who made up this huge speech, right? Who the father didn't even listen to that speech. He just, just put a robe on his back with a ring on his finger. Shoes on his feet. For my son that was dead is now alive. He came home. That's what repentance means. It's coming home to God. Come home. You've been away too long. Come home to God. Amen. And he's ready to receive you. He's waiting on the front porch. Not with a stick in hand, but with two arms to hug you and to love you. Amen? Look, the kingdom of God is here. So Isaiah foresaw John's ministry. He saw the way being prepared, the mountains being made low, the crooked ways being made straight. He saw a new world was coming, only not quite yet. John is making things ready for the things that, that are happening, that the world is about to be turned upside down. But he is not the, the only one that's going to overturn it. In fact, he's not going to be the one to overturn it. There's one that's coming that's going to overturn some things. For now, when people ask him what they should do, and it's interesting if you read this whole chapter, we didn't read it all to you today in Luke, but he's asked by people what they should do in response to his message. 
And he gives them old world answers. He says, do good, try harder, be generous, stop cheating. That's doable, right? It's difficult sometimes, but it's doable. But the one that he's talking about that's coming is going to usher in a new world. Jesus the Messiah will make impossible demands on his followers, like loving your enemies. How do you all do with that one? That's not a particularly good one with me, especially driving down I-12. <laughs> right? How about this one? Forgiving the way God forgives. You forgive? Everybody says, oh, you're supposed to forgive? Like God forgives. I know. How are you doing with that? Huh? We hold grudges at the smallest thing. Some of you, some of you got that. Boy, if they do me wrong, I'm gonna do them wrong. You know, I may I may smile at them when I see them, but I remember what they did. You got a memory like an elephant. <laughs> you know, that's our sinful nature, right? And the one I love, my favorite one, Nick, this is my favorite command from Jesus. Be perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect. You've heard me say that a lot. That's my favorite. How? Listen. You say, oh, people, they, you know, you get your, all your religious friends and they tell you they to keep the Ten Commandments, right? Oh, I'm living right. I'm a Christian. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, really. How about this command? I always ask them this one. Okay, that's great. Are you perfect like God is perfect? Some of us are shocked to find that God actually gives us commands we can't keep. And the reason he gives us commands we can't keep is so we'll turn to him, come home. Because we realize we can't do it on our own. And I know a lot of you think, oh, I came to church, I'll get better. I hope, and I think there's some getting better, but you haven't really noticed that you're getting all that better, are you? Don't look at me all religious. Oh, it was supposed to be better, Pastor, I know. <laughs> And this is the problem with most churches you go to, right? It's not that we're not saying that you shouldn't keep the Ten Commandments. You should. But you have to keep them with your motive. And you have to keep them with your mind. And you not only have to keep them on the outside, and Jesus did away with all that. And you're like, man, I can't keep these commands. And God's like, yes, yes, you get it. Now you need me. And that's what John the Baptist is announcing. He's announcing, while well, others are debating whether he's the Messiah, whether John the Baptist, and you don't love it, if, if you don't have the Gospel of John movie, you can watch it on YouTube. It's great. But I love John, <laughs> I love John the Baptist in there, because he's a wild man, right? And they come and ask him, are you the Messiah? He says, no. Are you Elijah? No. He says, well, we've got to have an answer for those that have told us to come to you. He said, I am the voice of him crying in the wilderness, and he screams at the top of his lungs, prepare! Be the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. And he just sits down. <laughs> right? And he's, he says, well, if you're not the Messiah, not a lie to who you are, he says, I indeed baptize you with water. But he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not even worthy to tie. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, and his fan his, is in his hand. You see that winnowing fork? You know what that's all about? I know we're not in an agriculture, but you have wheat, and they would take that fork, and they'd throw the wheat up in the air, and the good wheat that had weight to it falls to the ground. The chaff that didn't have weight to it, it got blown away in the wind. So the Bible says the ungodly are like the chaff. They have no weight to them. So when the winds come, the winds of false doctrine, the winds of this world, they just get blown away. But the wheat is solid, and it has some weight to it. You with me? And he said, that's what he's going to do. And he's going to take that chaff and burn it with unquenchable fire. It's no joke. There's heaven and hell here. But you can't work to get into heaven. And you don't have to do anything to go to hell. Boy, did I say heaven and hell in church? I thought it's amazing, right? Right? But I, there was a track one time, Haley, we had a little track. These tracks were these pieces of paper that he gave to people to tell you about Jesus, right? We don't kind of do that anymore. But they had these little tracks, right? And I always had a lot of tracks. I was a Bible junkie, see my tracks, you know. <laughs> but, you know, it had this, this one track, and it said what you had to do to go to hell. And you'd open it up, and there was nothing in it. <laughs> Just keep doing what you're doing. Keep pursuing your own way, right? 
instead of putting your faith in, in Christ. You'll preach this, you just got to say stuff like that. You were doing really good up to that, right? <laughs> but he says, I'm not the Messiah. Jesus is greater than I am. In fact, he existed before I was born. As we sang about God, the Son, today, the Word was with God and the Word was God. Right? So John, from his mother's womb, he was a, this was a great guy, the, the, as an unborn child leapt in the womb of his mother when he heard the voice of Mary talking to his mother, Elizabeth. It was a great story. You remember that story about John when John was about to be born, and we talked about it today, when his father was in the tabernacle offering the incense, and an angel appeared to him and said, Zechariah, your wife Elizabeth is going to have a son. They were old. Right? This was beyond. He says, this can't happen. I'm too old. And Gabriel said, I am, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And because you have not believed the words that I have said, he said, you're not going to say anything at all. you got nothing good to say. You're not going to say anything at all for nine months. But his name is going to be John. He's going to be great in the sight of the Lord. Gave him all this, but he didn't believe it. But Elizabeth believed it. And I love this. I was mentioning this to Kristen when we were talking about names today. Talking about how important names are, right? But when he was about to be, about to be circumcised, that's when they named the child. And it was like a good Italian family. If the father's name is Anthony, you call the, the son's name Anthony. That's just how it works, right? And even the Jew, well, his name, you know, he waited so long, Zechariah, to have a son. And they said, oh, his name is going to be Zechariah, just like his father. And Elizabeth said, no, his name will be John. And they marveled. And they still wanted to call him Zechariah. And so Zechariah, who could not speak, went over and got a writing tablet, and he wrote on it, his name is John. And they marveled again. And when he named John, the Bible said his tongue was loose, and he spoke, and he prophesied, and he praised God. Isn't that awesome? And you say, what's the big deal? Well, Zechariah's name means God has remembered. But John's name means God is gracious. God could not remember what Israel had done. They had sinned against him. They had turned to false gods. He could not remember their good deeds and all of the things that they tried to offer to him and all of their sacrifices. But he could give them his grace. Amen. His gracious love and his mercy that will be seen in Jesus Christ. Isn't that an awesome story, right? So John, from his mother's womb, leapt for joy in his father's arms. He was sung prophetically to sleep in the desert wilderness. And in the inviting wetness of Jordan, we finally see John in the last place we would ever expect to see him. In prison. That's what we read today. That Herod put him in prison. He is not there for doing something wrong. He's doing there for doing something right. See, John had spoken truth to power. Remember that? Well, I hear that a lot. Speak truth to power. Well, John spoke truth to power. And he spoke against Herod's adulterous relationship with Herodias, his brother Philip's beautiful wife. And Herod's government, man, was not a good government where innocent people are jailed, guilty people go free. Hmm. Sounds familiar. Right? Where prophets are beheaded and where the Messiah is going to eventually be crucified. That's the kind of government they were under. A place where doubts and pains cause us to wonder, is it all really worth it? I like what Carl Rayner said. He said, we too are sitting in a prison, the prison of death, of unanswered questions on our own weakness, in our own pitiful state of misery and the tragedy of life. But we will not get out alive. But daily, like John the Baptist, we want to send off messengers to find out, are you really the one? We want to send out messengers to Jesus and the messengers of our faith and of our prayer to the one who is yet to, to come to judge the living and the dead. These Advent-like messengers will always come back to report, see, I am coming. Blessed are those that are not turned off by me. So no matter what state we're in, what prison we're in, what we're suffering with, remember, Jesus is coming. Advent will happen. All flesh will see the salvation of our God, despite of what we see here and now. You know, if, think about it. We hear all this every day, all day, with all the power brokers, the political leaders, the big dogs. 
the atheistic detractors. They were in charge of John's day, just like they are ours. And it doesn't always look like God is running things, does it? Look at that, he's a little absent. I mean, tragedy and totalitarianism are not unique to human history. Indeed, the imprisonment of John the Baptist in verse 20 raised important questions about who was really in charge. I mean, if a good guy like John the Baptist can get thrown into prison, what about me? So to look beyond what we are expecting in the here and now is how God's word will help us to look to the coming one. God wants us to direct our gaze on the day when God's reign will usher in perfect peace and harmony. And the Bible says that when he comes, he is the prince of peace and the government will be on his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. If you're looking for good government and good leaders and all that here now, you're going to be disappointed. But the great leader is coming. The one that will level every score. The one that will do good. And that the, the one who was last will be first. And the first will be last. And everything this world hopes for is embodied in one person, Jesus Christ. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. Even in the here and now. Next thing is all flesh will see the salvation of God because we've already gotten a glimpse of it. See, the glimpse is Jesus, of course. He's our strength and he is our salvation. He was born in a major, visited by Magi. Did you ever notice the people that came to Jesus' birth? We'll talk about this. They weren't like really great. Shepherds, stinky shepherds smelled like sheep. They weren't even allowed in the temple. Magi. You know, magi is short for our word magician. They were witches, by the way. They were astrologers. That's how they determined this. God used where they were at to bring them to Jesus. See, Jesus is always dealing with the outcasts and the, the people that other people say can't be saved. That's the people he's interested in. Not by religious folk. Religious folk usually become his enemy. Mm -hmm. It's not about religion. It's about Christ. No, religion is good in, in a sense, in the, in the word what it means, but not being religious. You follow me? I'm still here with me? He preached the truth, Jesus, when he came, healed the sick, comforted the needy. He came to a world and turned it upside down by calling everyone to come home. Repent. Right? And he offered forgiveness to all who believe. In fact, he forgives you before you believe and just waits for you to come and believe it. Awesome. He forgave the whole world. They just have to believe it. Well, well, I don't understand that. If I put a million dollars in your bank, David, and you didn't believe it, you'd never cash a check. You'd never go to the... Oh, I believe that passes a million dollars. I don't believe that. Yeah, but there could be a million dollars in there right now. I, you, don't, you don't look at your bank balance. You don't go to the cashier. You don't do anything. That's what the, God has put this in, in, in the universe. He's put this in the bank. And you just got to believe that you have it. And believe that you need it. Stop trying to be all that. You're not all that. You're a sinner just like me. You're a screw up. You're a mess up. Welcome to the club. You got issues, so do I. I've got a bunch of issues. I can name that all to you today. I got a bunch of issues. I got sins and problems and shortcomings. If you do too, welcome to the church. Amen. Because that's what it is. People say, we people go to the church. Absolutely. Huh? Oh, you need that church. You're one of them people. Absolutely. You're not hurting my feelings. <laughs> and people say that, that's a bad thing, right? But Jesus came and he turned the world upside down, calling everyone to come home, offering forgiveness to everybody. Isaiah foretold his coming as John the Baptist. They were looking forward. See, at Advent, we look back. We look back to Jesus. We look back to his incarnation. That means him becoming a baby, God the Son becoming a child. But we also look back to his life and his ministry. We look back to his suffering and his rejection. We look back to his shame and his death. But we do not stop there. We look back above all to his resurrection from the dead. And we see his retribution and his restoration. And we, when we look back at 
his resurrection. He directs our eyes toward the future, his promised return. Like Isaiah and John, we look forward to the one day that you and I are going to be with him on that glorious day, trusting in the resurrected one. We'll return as he promised. And this promise sustains our faith and shapes our lives. Got that? Wave your hand in. Good. <laughs> Isaiah says, All flesh shall see the glory of the Lord, which Luke translates. And Isaiah says, All flesh will see the glory of the Lord. Let me stop there. I want to slow down. All flesh will see the glory of the Lord. And then Luke says, All flesh will see the salvation of our God. What's the glory? What's God's glory in? Saving people. Right? Yeah. The Bible says that we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He is the Savior. You still with me? Salvation is offered to all people who have faith in Jesus Christ. As Acts 10 and 43 says, all the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives the forgiveness of sins through his name. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. In the here and now, you've already gotten a glimpse in the last day all flesh shall see the salvation of God, and, it, and it, it's beginning to show in us. It's beginning to show in our lives. So the crowds in verse 10, we're reading, we're reading uh, here what, what John said to do in the light of the coming of Christ. John was concrete and direct. He gave directions appropriate for their context and their vocations. Share your tunics and your food, he says. Do your job with integrity. He was calling them to be a unique community. If you really believe the salvation of God is at hand, serve each other and your neighbors. Right? So those who believe in Jesus look forward to seeing the salvation of God on the last day. Busy themselves by serving others in common and daily ways. They fulfill their vocations with faithfulness and when possible, joy. Knowing that their labor in the Lord is not in vain. Right? You see, if you know Jesus is coming, you believe in his forgiveness, that he loves you, that you're in him, that everything you do becomes new. It becomes appropriate. Paul's prayer in our epistle reading that we read today, listen to this. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve what is excellent and be so pure and blameless in discernment that you may approve what is excellent and be, and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruits of righteousness that come through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Wow. So that you would abound more and more in love, that you be have knowledge and wisdom and discernment, that you would approve what is right, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Well, I don't know. I don't know if I can do that. You can't. Don't worry. That's why Philippians 1 and 6 says, and being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on. To in the glorious man, Jesus Christ, he comes into our vision so we can see him. We are not looking for him, but he has been looking for us. Last thing. In the end, all people indeed, of all creation, will see the salvation of God in Christ. Everybody will see it. The Bible said every eye will see it. We talked about that last week. In Philippians, I love this verse. It says, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. I don't know what enters into your mind when you see that. But of all the trillions of people that have gone on. And all the trillions of people that exist in the world. When Jesus comes back. There will be one solid voice together. Saying Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. There will be no doubt about it then about who's right and who's wrong. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And John, who was beginning to preach the salvation that Jesus will bring, is for all flesh was saying this, it's not just for Israel. The mountains are lowered. Think about this. Watch this. The mountains are lowered. The crooked ways are straight. The rough ways are smooth. So that all flesh, all people might see that they have access to salvation. Doesn't matter your color your background, your economy, 
the language that you speak. John said, when Jesus comes, everything's level. Everyone can be in the family. Praise God. Everyone is a part. Everyone is loved. Everyone is valued the same way. Who else can? I can't offer that to you. People can't offer that. You've been looking for that from people, and you're, that's why you're miserable. You've been looking for that for wealth and jobs and substances and everything else. Does it, does it work for you? Even when you do all that, there's no fulfillment of that. There is only one person that can fulfill your need, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen. Trust me. And he wants to do it for everyone. And John's baptism implies that Jewishness is no guarantee of salvation, and non-Jewishness is no hindrance from salvation. What matters is repentance baptism under the forgiveness of sins, believing in the one who is coming after him. Repentance, therefore, is the altering. Listen to this. The coming home, right? What does that mean? Please listen to this as I'm, I'm finishing up. The altering of what we rely on in life, what we hope in, and what we are counting on for salvation in the age to come and for help now. That's what we need to turn from. What are you relying on in this life? What are you hoping in? What are you counting on to save you? Only Christ can do it. The repentance that leads to forgiveness of sins is turning away from what we are by birth or achievement and relying wholly on His mercy, which is God's forgiving grace. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And everyone give a hearty amen. 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 Let's bow our heads.